Hello, my friends. Jerry Rosa here at the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. And the reason I can't keep from laughing <laughs> is after all the planning and preparation to make sure I do this right, I nearly forgot. <laughs> I <laughs> Emery had several videos she wanted me to review, and I, I got down here at about 7 a.m. this morning, and so I got engrossed in reviewing her videos, and I look at the clock, and it says 8 o'clock. <laughs> I went, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I ran in here, turned this thing on. Oh. <laughs> it's... I wrote, I wore the wrong shirt. It's just not easy being me. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Yeah, yeah, I definitely wore the wrong shirt. Well, I hope you're all doing well and hopefully better than I am <laughs> because now I'm all frazzled, you know, getting it uh, going here at the last second. I didn't have to tell you all that. I, you know, if I could have kept the laugh off of my face, I could have, I, I, you would never have hardly known, really, other than being maybe a minute late. <clears throat> I think we got a pretty good program lined up for you. You can see I've got a lot of stuff thrown out here on the table that I'm going to talk about. Um, it's mostly going to be talking about uh, easy things that you can do to kind of make your life better. It's also ways to save some money when you don't want to spend extra bucks just for a one-time clamp or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's just helpful little hints and, and, and most of it's going to be simple stuff. Looks like we got 21 folks on here now. Uh, by going live at 8 o'clock, it's going to be slow building up the viewers, I'm sure, but uh, I hope you're all uh, doing well and uh, we'll move right along. I've got a uh, outline, as usual, to follow. Um, the first thing I just want to remind everyone is that we'll be in Mountain View, Arkansas on uh, October 14th through 17th. And I say we, that means me, and, uh, you know, Bruce uh, from down in Mississippi is going to be there. And I'm hoping a couple of other folks from this local area will come with us and do some jamming down there. And it's just a jamming weekend. We just have fun. We just sit around and play music out under shade trees and under the gazebos that they provide there in Mountain View, Arkansas. There's lots of bed and breakfasts and places to stay in Mountain View. So uh, come join us if you're in the local area and you can do that. I, we sure would appreciate it. Um, Jake Jacobs, I mentioned him last week, was in the hospital. I don't know the exact uh, status of him, but it doesn't sound good. Uh, secondhand message. Uh, Emery got some sort of a message that uh, the son was probably going to come and pick up the guitar that he had left here. So that's not a real good sign, I don't think. Um, I don't honestly know his status, but uh, my prayers and thoughts are with him and his family. I. It's really sad because he was a nice, nice, really nice fella and uh, just pleasant man to be around. And he was, I know he was looking forward to having his guitar fixed up and having the uh, JJ inlaid in there. So there you go. Um, if anyone does know the status, please uh, put it in the comments there. Um, I've got a, uh, just a little couple of uh, photos here I just thought I'd show you real quick. In the upper left, I don't know if my cursor comes across on this, I don't know, I'm pointing, but in the upper left, you can see my T300 Bobcat is not looking in its best form. <laughs> I have the tracks and the drive cogs off of it. The tracks were supposed to be delivered yesterday, the new tracks, the drive cogs came a day or two ago, and you can see the new drive cogs laying there, uh, waiting to be assembled. Each one of those cogs weighs pretty close to 100 pounds. I'm going to say 90 pounds at least, <clears throat> maybe more than that. And uh, yeah, they're big, thick, heavy steel. Those are like two inches thick. Uh, it's solid steel, so it's really heavy. You know how heavy those weights are at the gym. 
And little old me gets to pick them up, put them on there. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've got mechanical ways to assist myself if I need it, but I think I can manhandle them up there. The, uh, yeah, it, it, it's expensive owning big equipment like that, but it's also, uh, it pays for itself, you know, it, even though that's cost me quite a bit over $3,000 to fix, probably close to $4,000, uh, it's worth it because, boy, it, 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 you know, the two years I've had that now, uh, it's really done a lot of work. The other two pictures, uh, the one in the lower middle there is the rental retreat. And you can see how my wife has fixed it up. And that giant pumpkin, if you can kind of figure out the size of that pumpkin compared to our stair tread, you can tell it's a pretty darn big pumpkin. She, most of her pumpkins that she grew this year were in the 40 pound class. Uh, some of them were as large as 60 pounds. So, you know, that's pretty big pumpkins. Those are not like world records by any stretch because they make, they grow pumpkins up to several thousand pounds now, two or three thousand anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, they, but believe it or not, those are the same variety as these pumpkins, the ones that grow that huge, uh, but they get a little more TLC. <laughs> they get, you know, they have like intravenous feedings and all kinds of things that they do to those pumpkins to grow them that large. And then the uh, top right corner is the front of front porch of our house where we live. And you can see she's gone all out there decorating it up for the fall harvest time also. And uh, it looks real nice. I thought she deserved a little press here in the uh, shop talk, the way she made those things look there. So uh, let me see what else is on my uh, outline here. Last week, I talked about the laser cutter, my uh, K40 laser cutter, and I was talking about how wonderful it is and yet how complicated it is that it, you really should know some stuff about software and be pretty good with computers before you sink money into it. But, you know, at $300 or, you know, between three and $400 for sure, um, it's a no-brainer really because of the work it can do. It, it, if you need that type of work, it's worth it. But the reason I wanted to bring it back up again this morning is that I really did mean to mention this last week and I failed and that is that uh, it does not cut shell very well. In fact, it, it really doesn't cut any kind of reflective surfaces. It doesn't cut metal. Um, so shell is a reflective surface and it just, it kind of etches shell. In other words, if you were doing abalone or mother of pearl or something, you can kind of see an etching, but that's about as good as it gets. So don't buy it thinking you're going to go cutting your mother of pearl and shell with it. It doesn't work that well for that kind of stuff. Uh, which is one of the reasons I've turned to mostly wood, but then after doing the wood, I just like the look of it. I just think it looks so much nicer. I just think it looks real rich. Um, I don't know. It's just my opinion. I think wood is beautiful, and especially when you can use all the different colors of woods to make a scene and things that people do. That's been done for, you know, at least hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. People have made... Uh, you know, scenes with wood. Mark, they, I believe they refer to it as market tree. But uh, anyway, <clears throat> uh, there's another couple of words that I can't call up in my brain right at the moment, but that, that they refer to with that stuff too. Um, I don't have my link in my description yet, but I was planning to put a link to uh, a couple of guys that were playing. J.P. Cormier and uh, Ray Legere. Uh, J.P. Cormier, uh, had, was I was put on to him by uh, friends of Victor up there in Canada. And I can't think of the gentleman's name right now because I'm horrible with names, as you know. Um, but uh, it's one of Victor's real good um, either relatives or friends that... Uh, sent me the information about J.P. Cormier. I'm sure many of you already know about him. He's a real good picker. But uh, the one that I really liked was uh, they were doing some, you know, a lot of bluegrass. And uh, Ray Legere has won, I think, the mandolin championship at uh, Winfield, Kansas before. And those two guys were uh, had a real good session. Uh, the thing I noticed about it was uh, I watched it at between 3.30 and 5 o'clock one morning. <laughs> 
and it held my attention that whole time. So, you know, maybe I was delirious, <laughs> but I think if you go and look those guys up, J.P. Cormier, which is uh, C-O-R-M-I-E-R, and then uh, Ray Legier, L-E-G-E-R-E, -E, I think you'll be quite happy. And give them a subscribe and uh, put a comment in there and say that Jerry Rosa sent you. So that uh, I think it's always good that we all support one another and help one another rather than tear one another down like so many do. Um, I will try to get that uh, link in the description yet today. And I know my faithful assistant over there is already hearing me and he's already thinking of how he can put that in there. <laughs> but it, they were in, a, they were just in what they called a... Um, they call it a, a barn, uh, some gal's name, barn. Um, it, anyway, they have sessions there, uh, uh, regular sessions there all the time. But this was the one I thought was really good, and I think you'll enjoy it if you watch it. And even if, you, and if you're on the edge about bluegrass and whether you really think it's good or not, if you listen to this, I think it'll change your mind. They, those guys were really doing some good picking. Okay, uh, Rich Reisner, another good friend of the channel here, sent me a box full of antler, and I always appreciate antler. Thank you so much, Rich. I, I really do appreciate it. Just got that yesterday, so thanks very much. Jigs and fixtures. Well, you could also uh, refer to this as poor man's clamps, a lot of it. Uh, not all of it's about clamps, but, a lot, but some of it is. For instance, you see this and you think, how could that be a clamp? Well, like for instance, if you're gluing a guitar top uh, and you want to get, get the braces you know, and try to glue them in the middle of a guitar top, you can, you know, the top slides through here, your brace is in here, and say the brace is all the way in the middle of the guitar, you can slide this through there. It's just, you know, three quarter inch plywood. Then you can put a spacer in there if you, need, if you need it, and then you put a little wedge in there to tighten it up. And it's an excellent clamp. I mean, it really is excellent. It works very, very good, and it's cheap as, you know, a piece of scrap plywood. Um, very, very good for that kind of clamping. Um, I've done it many, many times when, you know, you know, I've got most of the mechanical clamps that will reach most places, but whenever I run into something that I'm just having trouble with, or maybe I need more clamps, this is what I go to. And it works really, really well. So I just wanted to point that out and dirt cheap. Um, and if you don't know what I mean by a wedge, by the way, it's just something as simple as that. You just slide a little wedge in there, and as you force that in there, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter, and uh, it, you know, really, really does put the pressure on something to clamp it. And you can even, you know, if you really need it, you can even tap it lightly with, you know, a tool or a hammer or something. Everything's a hammer, so you can tap it with anything. <laughs> But uh, anyway, that tightens it up. And just a side note, you saw the picture of the Bobcat with the tracks on it. Those big, large wheel uh, sprockets, or I, you know, they're not really wheel sprockets, they're drive sprockets. Oh my gosh, were they hard to get off. They were so hard to get off. Uh, they've got three holes that you can drive bolts in and they're supposed to push the uh, sprocket back off. It just twisted the bolts off. I, they, it didn't move it one little tiny amount. So then I had to drill all that out, rethread it, and put new bolts in there and try to push it out. Couldn't get no progress at all. Finally, what did I use to get it off? Wedges. I just put some wedges right behind the sprocket, started driving them in, and that popped the sprocket right off. So wedges are crazy powerful tools. You can move the world with a wedge. If, you know, you've heard that with a lever, you could move the world with a wedge if you had something to pry against, like Jupiter or something, you know. Um, anyway, that's that kind of clamp. Um, here's another version of that. And, you know, people see stuff like this and they go, um, uh, you know, you can't thread wood. Well, I'm telling you, you can. <laughs> Tell Mat uh, Matthias uh, Wandel that, uh, uh, you know, 
he he does it all the time. He threads wood all the time, and uh, you know, and it works. It works great, especially hardwood. This is a piece of maple, and you can make a great clamp and just works really fine. You know, I just put. I happen to have a welder, so I just. This is just a plain old bolt. Bolt, as you can see. And I just welded a little piece of wire or piece of metal rod across there to act as a handle. Works great. I mean, it's not the best clamp in the world, but if you're in a pinch, this is a really good clamp. If you don't have one, this is a really good version. Very simple to do. Of course, you got to have the right tools to cut a thread too, of course, and you cut those with taps and. Uh, well, taps and dies, but dies dies cut the threads on the on the uh, rod, and taps cut the thread in the hole. Uh, here's just yet another version of that, and of course, I needed a much wider opening in this case, as you can tell, and it's the exact same thing though. And it's, you can put a tremendous amount of pressure on this. And now, if you were using plain regular sawed wood, this would split right here, and it wouldn't work as a clamp. Uh, it would not work, but because this is plywood, multiple layers, and those layers are all going different directions, this works great as a clamp. Very cheap, very good way to do it, and it only takes a minute. You, even if you don't have one of those pre-made and you decide you need one while you've got your glue wet, you can make one of those quick enough to still save the day. Um, Show you some more, yet some more of those. Like I'm just proving to you that I use them. You know, uh, here's another one. Here's a really big version where I needed a lot of pressure, and uh, you know, I drove a. I'm sure I drove a heavy wedge in there, and that would really put the pressure on something. Trust me, you could crush a guitar top with this with this clamp, but it worked for whatever I needed it for, and I've had that for years. I don't even remember what I used it for. And if you think that was the biggest, nope, here you go. So to, to say that those are, you know, just not worth it, you'd be wrong because they are worth it. Um, and it's so simple. It's something, it's, a lot of people may not even think to try that. <clears throat> Cheers, well water. Getting a little choked up there. All right, some more wooden uh, things. This is called a bench dog. And as you can see, there's a very slight angle in on this. That's so that hooks really good. Very slight angle on this, so it hooks really good. And what you do is you can slide this on the edge of your table like so. And of course, not with carpet on here, but that will hold on the edge of that table. And then if you're banging into something and you could put your work over here, like if you're using a chisel, you can lay your work here and, and your work will catch on that right there. And then you can use a chisel to drive. This is a very, very handy tool, especially when you're carving a mandolin top or maybe even a guitar top. And you might want to make one bigger or, you know, to, to suit the size of your work. This was just scrap wood laying around one day and I made it and uh, it works great for carving mandolin tops and I'll be using it again very soon I hope if I can get my hands to work. <clears throat> so if, if you don't understand how, how that's made it's just I just screwed it and I, I almost always glue things like that too so I'm sure I put glue on there and then I put the screws in there too. So, okay, <clears throat> let's, uh, well, we're still talking mostly clamping and holding. Um, these are just little crazy things that you, you know, I made. Um, you know, when you try to clamp uh, around a round guitar and you put clamps across, it just doesn't work. And maybe you've got a long crack that you're trying to close up. Well, you know, one clamp just across the biggest part isn't good enough. You need a lot of, sometimes you need clamps on the, where it's angled in and the clamps won't hold on that angle, you know, that, those round edges. Well, you can make something like this. This is just an old two by four that I cut and uh, you can put that around, you know, just you cut it to the shape of your guitar, whatever. Uh, you don't always have to cut these out, but a lot of times your clamps aren't long enough to reach across, so I cut these out so that my clamps could reach. 
and uh, you know, and it gives you a flat place to clamp. And then you can pull, and you can put a clamp. You can put a clamp here in the middle. You put a clamp on each end and pull that guitar side together. And of course, you have a matching one on the other side that you you, you can squeeze that guitar body back together. Then, so these are very, very, very handy. Very, very, very cheap. <clears throat> same way, exact same thing for just a different shape or different size guitar. Um, okay, <clears throat> let's move on to uh, things to use at the drill press that are uh, easy and simple. Um, the simple, whoops, the simplest of all is just a plain old block of wood. Now this one, in hindsight, I kind of regret using this because it's a piece of teak. <laughs> but on the other hand, it's really come in very super handy over the last 25 years I've been using this thing. And you can see it's been drilled into, I'm sure I've drilled a few of those myself, but for the most part, I always put a piece of scrap wood between the drill bit and this, or between my work and this, uh, so that when I drill through my work, I drill into a piece of scrap wood. My wife and my son and, you know, a number of other folks that use my shop aren't always quite that careful, and I'm sure I've done the same thing too, so I, I can't blame them entirely. But typically, I don't drill into this. But I use it to hold work in, in particular ways. For instance, I've squared this block. And it, it, it tells you on the side here, you can't see it because it's a very light pencil at this point. This is square and this, and this side here doesn't say square. So like if I really wanted something square, like I can lay this on the table and then I know that this is square, perfectly square to the table. And uh, I can then clamp something to the, to the side of this block or hold it to the side of this, and I know I'm drilling square down through it. So it's, it's just handy to have. Now, where I use it mostly is for drilling peg head holes into the in instrument's necks. And I'm going to show you the status of the last hurrah guitar, so I'll just use it as my demonstration. Oh, all right, well, give me a piece of tape. <laughs> My assistant reminded me I don't have the name covered up on the, <laughs> on the guitar, so I can't show you that yet. But basically what I do is I put the, uh, I put the uh, peg head on here. I got it. Okay. It wasn't the guitar. <laughs> anyway, I put the peg head on here. And see, and a lot of times you'll have clamps on your peg head uh, for various reasons. For one thing, you got to clamp on jigs. Like you might have to clamp this jig on, this drilling jig on. So you got clamps in the way. So when you get all that clamps and stuff, then you can't set that down on your flat table. But you can set it across here. You put your clamp here, put your clamp here, and you can set it on this. That's what the block of wood is handy for. So you might think, why am I spending this much time talking about a block of wood? Trust me, this is super, super, super handy at the drill press to have a big block of wood like this and you set your work up on it and uh, you know it allows plenty of room for clamping and things like that. There you go. Okay, my assistant has taped off the name. So again, just to show you, I, that's all I was going to show you was that I do it like that. You know, and, and then you can just drill down into it. And you put a piece of scrap wood between the block and this. Um, I will, might as well, since I got the guitar, I'll go ahead and digress and show you this because I got a, quite a few more jigs and fixtures to show you. But here's, here's the current status of the guitar. And uh, it's really turned out nicely. The inlay has worked out really beautiful. I, I wish I could show you the name because it really turned out pretty. It, it's exceptional, I think. And then you can see the whole body and everything. And I've done a light sanding on it. I don't have a heel cap made yet, so I've got to make I've got to make a heel cap. I've got to make a truss rod cover, and I got to make a um, you know a pick guard and a bridge. So those are the things I've got to make. But I'm trying to get it sanded so that I can put the first coats of varnish on it before I leave for my trip tomorrow. I'm going to uh, Ohio for a couple of days to visit visit my grandsons. 
one should be out soon. Pardon me? Part one should be out soon. Part one on this will be out this weekend, by the way. So you'll get to see the process of building it. <clears throat> okay. But those of you who have been faithful and following me on the shop talks, you've been watching the progress all along anyway. So that's uh, kind of been a bonus for you to watch the shop talks. Okay, going back to these jigs and fixtures, um, and, uh, and talking about the drill press still, I use lots of these, and you can clamp these onto your peg head, obviously, and then you've got a drill guide to drill through. Now, I typically always use a hardwood for these. Uh, hardwoods, you know, are just that. They're hard, and they, the drill doesn't wear them out very much. Uh, you can use these many, many, many times. I, I don't even know how many peg heads I've drilled with this. You can see some evidence of that, that there's some scarring around the, where I've hit, the, hit it with the uh, drill bit. But, uh, but the hole itself is perfect. And it drills a really good hole. And you need something like this to, uh, to drill your uh, peg holes very, very accurately. Because especially like on the ones that are in line tuning keys, they don't give. You know, if those holes aren't lined up perfectly, then your, tuning, then your posts are going to bind in the holes. And then when you start turning, they're really hard to turn. And, you know, you just don't want that. So this lines it up perfectly so that the, they slide in there just as, you know, perfectly smooth. And you can take them right back out and slide them right back in by hand. If you're having to force them in, something ain't right. So you make yourself stuff like this. Now, how do you make these kinds of things? Well, you need to start with something that's accurate. Um, you know, I, I first bought the little uh, jig from Stumac, and then I made this up. Uh, it was only for doing one side at a time. Well, I, you know, thought if I had to clamp all this up and make it all that perfect, if I just make myself a permanent deal like this, that's the shape of the peg head, then I can set this right on the peg head and it's easy to align, it's easy to drill all the holes at once. So this was way better to me than just drilling one side and then drilling the other side. Same exact reason for this peg head here. Now this actually came from Martin, believe it or not. <laughs> they, uh, a friend of mine, um, you've seen him in the shop before, uh, Bill built his guitar here. And uh, anyway, he had a bunch of these things he got from the Martin uh, shop when he visited there they just gave them to him since he bought a kit so anyway i just use one of these as my alignment for drilling the, the holes i made this one for that 12 string now you see here i only made one side and the reason i did that was because i only made one 12 string if i was going to be making a bunch of 12 strings i would have made a full one but this, and I was fortunate to have a um, milling machine so I could clamp this in a vise and move it so many thousandths of an inch and then drill and then move it so many thousandths of an inch and drill. So I know these holes were very accurately drilled with my milling machine. So anyway, that's, those are just dr uh, drilled fixtures, jigs, whatever you want to call it, that uh, work really well. And you really do need them, especially for inline tuning keys. Um, if they're individual tuning keys, it's still important for the looks for them to be in line and straight and all that, but they're not nearly as important on the spacing uh, if they're individual tuning keys. Here's another drilling jig that I use. Um, didn't used to use this, but I, because of so much trouble with my hands, I started drilling uh, the tops like on a on a mandolin, you know, I, I'll carve the outside and get the outside shape approximate. Then I lay the outside on here, on top of this. This is clamped to the drill press, and this is directly under the bit. And I have a stop on the, on the bit so it can only go so far. In other words, it can't go all the way to the nail. It, it has to stop, say, at a quarter inch from the nail. And then I can slide that top under here anywhere I want to and drill. And then I know I've got that much thickness of wood left. And then I can carve really fastly or grind it or any way I want to take the wood out. I can do it very easily and know I've still got that much wood left. So that's why I use this is just as a, uh, a way to carve the inside of a mandolin or the inside of a guitar for that matter if you wanted to carve a guitar top. Um, so this is a very handy jig also. 
And of course, your drill press needs to have a stop on it so that you don't drill all the way through because that wouldn't be good. The only uh, issue you will have if you try this approach for drilling through is when you lift the drill back up, it may lift your top back up. So you want to try to... Uh, you know, avoid any problems by having a good grip on it, a good firm hold and everything. So just be careful when you do those kinds of things. The same way with really drilling these things too. Uh, I find where you have your most problems when you're drilling really, really accurate stuff is when you're retracting the drill press. It's not so much going down, it's coming out. It'll, it'll grab and twist and pull and tear your hole up or something like that. So be very careful on the retraction when you are drilling accurate, accurate holes like that. Okay, um, now we just got a mixture of things. This is a jig and fixture I made, whatever you want to refer to it again. This fits on my uh, table of my uh, uh, disc sander, uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a um, a round disc, and I also you know it's uh, one of those combination sanders. Um, anyway, that this fits on the disc portion of the sander on the table. This fits in the T slot right here, and this just hangs over the end of the table. This kind of locks it in place, and you think, well, what is this for? Well, this slides as you can see. And you can put different holes in here for different lengths of radius. And this can make a radius. Now, I use it for putting radiuses on. I made this one specifically to put radiuses on my antler saddles. So if somebody says, I want a 12-inch radius, I have a 12-inch hole right here. Um, and I can slide this right through the sander like so and sand that radius right into it. And it works wonderfully. It really is very, very accurate. So you can make any radius you want. You can make this any length you want. I don't need it very big. So I have a 12, 14, and 15, I think, is what I've got right here right now. That's easy to get to. And uh, anyway, it's, it's just a simple little jig. It didn't take very much time to make. And it just it makes your radiusing very, very, very accurate. Another little helpful wooden jig that you can make is just something like this. I make it in the shape of a bridge. I made it for 12 because sometimes you're working on 12 strings. So I made it to hold 12 uh, pegs, and, and the string pegs. And you know, it doesn't always matter that you get the peg back in the same hole, but sometimes it really matters because some guitars are really finicky about which peg goes in which hole. Um, it just depends on how they were made and how, how they fit up. Doesn't really matter whether that's a problem or not. You just put them in order in these holes, whether it matters or not to that particular guitar. The reason I say you do that is because then you don't have to worry about it, number one. And number two, the most important reason of all is you don't lose them. This holds them for you until you're ready to put them back in. So this is super handy. I also make it in the shape of the bridge so that I know which way uh, goes because you can turn it around. If you made it perfectly square, you could get it turned around and you'd be going, I uh, forget which side, which peg goes on which end, you know, you wouldn't know. So this helps you with that. Lots of just little simple things like that. Just make your life a lot easier, trust me. Uh, let's see here. This, uh, when you get to do a neck removal, now someone sent me this and I, I modified it significantly to work for me better. Uh, you know, I'm, the way they sent it would work. Uh, it, it definitely would work. But because I do a lot of stuff and, and I, I have to make it fit a lot of different instruments, I modified this fairly significantly. And, um, you know, I put leather pads here so Basically, what you're doing is you're putting this around your guitar. Your guitar neck comes out this way. So this is, you know, your sound hole would, just to give you an idea, your sound hole would be about right here. And, you know, it goes like this. So your neck is sticking out this way. This goes under the very heel of the neck of the guitar. I put leather here too, by the way. And um, 
anyway this and this just sits flat on the top then you tighten all this down get it in, in situation as you're getting that neck loosened up and and you know maybe steaming it off or whatever you can tighten these and these will then lift your neck right out of the uh, dovetail slot uh, very simple jig to make again now the one of the main differences is i put a piece of bar steel across here and you might say well isn't that overkill no trust me you put a lot of pressure on this and that piece of steel won't give where you can break a piece of wood or you can you know just have issues with when you use wood here but you put that piece of steel on there and it don't give and it will make that neck listen to you and come out of the uh out of the slot so that steel is a big improvement believe it or not back here the wood is perfectly fine again i've got the leather padding here to avoid any problems um, this tape just helps keep like where the edges of the guitar might bump it. Uh, you can't put the tape all the way there. Uh, so you gotta be a little careful with this part right here because you could scratch the instrument. And you gotta be careful all the time anyway with instruments. But, but my point is it's a fairly simple jig and it works really, really well. Very effective. I had made one of these before myself but this one, the one that the, the viewer sent me was actually better uh, for the purposes that I needed. And I, I decided to just modify this one rather than modify the one that I had built originally. So it worked out really well for me. We've used it quite a few times. Caleb's used that more than I have. <laughs> but uh, I, I have taken out a number of necks myself. Okay, this last two are not very impressive, but... Uh, this one in particular I think is very helpful if you cut rosettes on your drill press. I don't do that anymore. I used to. Um, but, you know, I, I made this bottom piece here oversized where I could clamp it down. Then I had this pin here where I could drill a hole for the center of the uh, sound hole. And I'd set the top on here on this pin and that located it. And then, you know, you... Uh, you can uh, drill, you know, use, uh, I can't think of the right word, uh, use the cutter that will cut that, uh, the uh, grooves in there. And if you haven't seen one of those cutters, they're, they're kind of dangerous, kind of spooky. Let me see if I can find it real quick. You know, this, this kind of cutter, uh, yeah, I, they work pretty well. Uh, this goes down through that hole. Actually, in this case, you can't have the, the pin there uh, when you're using this because this, this becomes your pin. This, this drills through the center first, and then this cuts the groove. Um, and you have to adjust this microscopically. It's very difficult to adjust and all that, and it's just as dangerous as it can be. But... It works for cutting, you know, rosettes on a guitar top if you're careful and, you know, I used to use it. I did it, I don't know, probably five or six guitars I used this method on. Now you know that I use Dremel tools and uh, use a pivot and, um, you know, spin the, dr uh, the Dremel tool, kind of like a, a miniature router uh, around and cut the rosettes with that. Much more controllable. It's the way I would recommend you do it. But if that's the only option you got, it sure is better than nothing. Um, let's see, this one here, again, this one is just mostly to use with my Dremel. Again, it's got this center hole here for the pilot, for the little bit. I, a lot of times I just stick a drill bit in there and then slide, lay my guitar top with that same hole drilled right in the center of the, where the sound hole goes. And then I use that as my alignment pin. Then I just take my uh, Dremel router and spin it on that pin or on that drill bit in, in some cases. And, um, I hope that makes sense to you. It's, it's, I've shown it in a number of videos, but those kind, you just need something good and flat. Uh, and so this board is really flat. You know, I made sure about that. So you can clamp that down to your workbench, and then and then have everything really stable and spin your router around that. Just a minor, simple jig that you need, I think, when you're doing this kind of work. Um, I think that covers all the jigs and fixtures that I had here.
Um, I don't know. We're about ready to go to questions, I think. Uh, I've shown you the last hurrah guitar already, so we're good on that. Let me get rid of the stuff that's on my screen here. Uh, I'm going to uh, take just a quick break here to get my uh, different chat thing going because I didn't have time to get it going. As you know, I started late. So I'm going to get this other little chat thing going real quick, and uh, you can watch this while I do that. Well, that was Renee Caudill singing that. That's Emery's mother, by the way. And uh, Renee was our bass player uh, for a number of years in the band, and she got brain cancer, and that was terrible. If you have questions, go ahead and start posting those. I noticed someone made a comment about they uh, went back and watched the uh, video on my Nashville number system. That was Bill Webb. He's been here many times, actually. And uh, he said, made him get his mandolin back out. And uh, anyway, uh, the Nashville number system is very important to me, I think. Uh, I, you know, it just changed everything for me when I learned that. And that's the way I teach you to play the mandolin, uh, is using the Nashville number system. So if you want that training, it is available on my website. Have you ever, uh, well, now I've lost my, after going to get it, it took off on me. Let me find that question here again. Um, well, I lost that one, but is it worth it to get bone nut and saddle for all for a all laminate guitar? Uh, well, not so much the nut. I you know I I've said it many many times. The nut really on a scale of one to ten, it's about a one or a two in terms of your sound. And, it, I, and I'm giving it a lot of credit when I give it a one or two. Honestly, I typically say it just doesn't make any difference in your sound. Um, I know a lot of people would argue that all day long and say it makes all kinds of difference. It doesn't. You know, you in a blind test, you'd never know the difference whether you were listening to a plastic nut or a bone nut or, you know, a pearl nut or whatever. The nut is way overrated in terms of sound. Um, where the where it makes a difference is on the nut uh, on the uh, saddle end. And yes, there a bone saddle would help even a laminate guitar. You would you'd be happy, I believe, if you went that way. Um, <clears throat> Wayne Smith says the UK plumbers use that whole cutter for water tank uh, connections. Yeah, those yeah, those are dangerous, man. <laughs> I mean, that thing is spinning around there. It's just it's waiting to grab a hold of you, some part of you, and then it wants to remove that part. So you know, just be really careful if you use that kind of cutter. Uh, my buddy at Minim Guitars, have you ever used Beach? No, I have not. Um, I've got some and I'll use it, uh, but not buying it again. It's way too hard to work with, way too hard to work with. Now that surprises me. I wouldn't have guessed that. I would have thought Beach would have been kind of moderate, really. I, I would have thought it would have been softer than Maple. But I don't know. I've never used it. <clears throat> Why are peg heads on mandolins so clumsy? Well, I would say that that's your opinion. I don't find them clumsy at all. I find them incredibly perfect. So I don't know. You know, I don't know what you mean by clumsy. Um, truly, I can't even relate to that. So I don't know what you mean. Um, looking to see if there's any more questions. We might be finished early today. 
Is there any reason not to use CNC machine to cut out parts for acoustic guitar? No, there's no reason not to do it. Um, you know, handmade is handmade. Um, you know, people put a little bit too much stock in handmade sometimes because handmade means there's going to be minor flaws in there. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's really what it means. Um, but on the other hand, it's also super attention to super detail if you hand make it correctly. Where the CNC machine knows what it knows and it don't know no more than that. <laughs> and that's the difference. But if you made the part on a CNC machine and then you and you know do a close uh, look over with your eye and your it could it could equate to the exact same thing as a handmade guitar as long as you are very 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 careful about that um, so I have no problem with using a CNC machine I just don't happen to have one and and unfortunately RSW is on the way out not on the way in so I probably won't be getting one um, Let's see, can you do ATV around your farm? Yes, we ATV all the time. Matter of fact, we've wore out several ATVs here. Uh, matter of fact, my Polaris Ranger, my 2008, or is it 2009? I forget now. I think it's a 2009 Polaris Ranger. It's pretty much seen its better, better days. That's a side-by-side. -side. And then we've got a couple of uh, the regular four-wheelers that we've wore out too. And matter of fact, we had a red one. Now we've got a green one that's wore out, and we just recently bought a new green one. Uh, and I green, they're they're all Honda Recons. We like the little Recons. We like the two wheel drive as opposed to the four wheel drive. I know so many people just swear by the four wheel drive. I you know you'd have to almost force it on me. Uh, that little two wheel drive, I can just beat people through these trails because it's so it's small, it's narrow, small, easy to go, and it'll climb anything. I've never seen one single thing where it wouldn't climb. And trust me, I've had it in some places that you just wouldn't believe. Um, in fact, yeah, I wish I could have filmed a couple of them. <laughs> I don't think you could have believed where I've had that little two wheel drive four, four wheeler and it just goes anywhere. So. That Honda Recon, I'm not doing an advertisement for them, but it's a good little machine. It really is. Uh, could nuts and saddles be made out of glass or ceramics? I would say no. I don't think I would do that. I, I think that's harsh. Uh, too, you're going a little too hard that way. I don't think it would hurt on your nut, but on your on your saddle, yeah, I don't. I, don't, I think you'd be hurting yourself on that. I think you'd hear it sound kind of metallic. Um, it, it wouldn't, I don't believe it'd be a pretty sound. Uh, I've never tried it, so I could be completely wrong, but you know, I'm just going by what I would expect, and I'm pretty sure you would, ex would experience an ugly sound on the saddle end. Plus, it'd be brittle, you know, I, I'm not sure I'd want that, but anyway. Do you try, uh, I don't know what that is. Somebody's talking about food there. I can pretty much tell you no. I'm not a food person. So whatever you ask, do I eat such and so? 99 times out of 100 when you ask that, it's going to be no. Because <laughs> I don't eat much. I, I'm very particular on what I eat. The most particular you've ever met. I used plexiglass for a saddle and it worked good. Um... Perhaps. Uh, I could see plexiglass perhaps because it's a little softer than glass. Glass is much, much different than plexiglass. I could, I, you know, plexiglass would be the same as using a plastic bridge. I mean, that's really what you're, I mean, a plastic saddle. That's what you're talking about. Plexiglass is plastic. So I don't see a problem with using plexiglass, although it wouldn't be my first choice. You recommend uh, Eastman as a consistent quality beginner mandolin. They are not inexpensive here in England. Have you anything to say for the Lore or Ozark? Well, I, the Ozark, you know, I think I've heard of that or seen one or two of those, but I don't know much about the Ozark. But the, the Lore is typically pretty good. 
um, but you know, on a case by case basis, you have to you have to look at each lure. Uh, I can't guarantee you that they're all going to be good. For the most part, the Eastmans are pretty good when you get those. Um, the lowers, on the other hand, I've seen some really nice ones, and I've seen some that are eh, not so good. You know, so you just have to go on a case by case basis. Is what I'd have to tell you there. Um, <clears throat> uh building first uke up to setting the neck do you find pulling sandpaper from fretboard to heel wears the heel quicker having issues with the heel setting well i'll be honest with you dan i don't use sanding at all when i'm setting a neck um i well i say at all i mean i maybe at the very very end just to clean it up but i set necks and the angles totally with chisels and or with finger planes, things like that. Mostly with chisels though. Um, and very sharp chisels and I, I do not use sanding. Now, I'm sure you could get by with that, but it, you know, when you're doing pro pro production work like I am and, you know, time is money uh, and you don't want to run the bill up for your customer, you better do it the fastest way you can do it. So um, anyway, Chisels are the way to go, in my opinion, for setting a neck and setting the angle, but you do have to know what you're doing, and you do have to take very, very, very light cuts. Uh, you know, you always, and I'll just say this and be done with this part on neck resets, you always want to sneak up on it. You don't want to go, oh, I need to take off this much and just start ripping it off of there. You take off the least amount, check it, least amount, check it, and, and proceed that way. Uh, Chuck, have you ever used inlaced to do inlays? It's a casting plastic. Well, I'd, I've never heard of anything called that, so I don't guess so, Chuck. But I've used a few different plastics for some inlay over the years. Um, that's the best I can tell you. So, no, I, I don't, I'm not familiar with that particular brand name. Why are tuning keys posts are the positions that are generally in like distance from the nut end? Hmm. I'm not sure I follow Ken G's question there. Why are tuning key posts in the position that they are generally in like distance from the nut end and angle of the strings from the nut? Well, the angle uh, puts pressure down on the nut. You definitely want it to have some pressure down on the nut. Otherwise, it's going to buzz and rattle and give you trouble. So that's the reason for the angle. The positioning, I'm not quite sure I understand your question there. But um, for sure, you want some angle. Uh, <clears throat> Tuning keys are different on nylon and steel string guitars. Why don't they find the best kind and use them on all guitars? Well, uh, the, the larger um, posts, the larger posts that they use on the uh, classical guitars are for uh, the nylon strings. Uh, you know, having a bigger post puts less pressure on that nylon, um, you know, spreads the stress out. So that's why I would suppose they use the larger posts on the, on the classical type instruments and nylon string guitars. You can get away with the smaller post on the uh, steel string and that's why they do that. Um, there, you're kind of comparing apples and oranges in my opinion and they have a different purpose. It's kind of like having why you have more than one kind of hammer, you know. Uh, you're doing different jobs with it, and that's kind of the way I look at that. Richard Ingram, if I like a woody or bass sound, would an antler bridge be better or worse than wood? Well, Richard, uh, you know, I only make the two claims with the antler. Uh, I make the claim that it will make your instrument louder and that you won't break strings. Those are the two claims I absolutely make. 
In my opinion, if you've got a good woody sounding instrument, the antler uh, only enhances it. I don't see it causing any problem at all. If you have a thin, tinny sounding um, mandolin, then you're going to hear a lot more of that, you know, because it, it makes it louder, you know. And so I, it does, in my opinion, the antler doesn't change the tone very much at all. Now, on the other hand, having said that, I get countless uh, emails that say, I am not talking those up big enough that they enhance the tone, they give you better sustain, they da 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 da. I don't doubt the sustain thing. Um, yeah, I, I kind of imagine they probably do give you a good sustain. Um, but I don't say they, they improve your tone. I, you know, so that's up to you. Um, but the wood is. Obviously, wood is very good. Uh, it's been used for hundreds of years, you know. Um, ebony wood would be the only choice I would use for a wooden saddle, though. I don't think I would use rosewood or anything else. Uh, Paduke might be okay. I haven't tried Paduke. But uh, anyway. <clears throat> Let's see. I ha uh, have you done a guitar with an open peg head? If so, how do you set up to drill the tuners? No, I haven't. I haven't done a slotted peg head there, Ed. I'm sorry. I, so I, I can't really say. I'm trying to think. I've had experience with lots of slotted peg heads, but I'm trying to remember if I've ever drilled one. I don't think. Actually, I think I did. I think I had one that was broken one time. Uh, had a piece broken out of it or something up there, and I had to replace the piece and then redrill it. You know, it was a one-off thing. I so I don't remember uh, exactly what I did, but no, I don't really have a lot of experience with that, so I probably shouldn't make too many comments about it. Um, let's see here. We're about out of time. I don't see any more questions. I'll give it a few seconds here for one more question, if anybody wants to post one. We're up to 128 viewers, not quite as many viewers as we were typically getting when we started it with a 30-minute uh, opening there. And I'll have to be doing better to make sure I don't get sidetracked and get them started on time in the future. <laughs> But in the future, so uh, just to recap, next Friday morning, uh, not tomorrow, but next week Friday, we'll start at 8 o'clock. We won't have the 30-minute lead time into it. It'll just start live. So try to be there and join in just as quick as you can at 8 o'clock sharp next Friday morning. I want to thank you all for tuning in today. I hope you got something out of this. Uh, I did say I'd take one more question, and there's just two more just showed up. Uh, I don't understand Richard's question about the eight string electric uke, so I'm going to pass on that one. How so calculate the neck angle? How do you calculate the neck angle for an instrument? Well, in short, um, it, I do it kind of by the seat of my pants, and that's just the truth of it. Um, you put a straight edge on here and you measure back here. Uh, without the fretboard on here, you want this you, that angle when you put a flat straight edge here and you measure back to where the bridge saddle will be, you want to have a little bit of clearance there. You want to have about a sixteenth of an inch, uh, about sixty thousandths, millimeter and a half, something like that right there would be pretty good. That's probably your best advice. With your fretboard on there, um, then you know you, you might be better off putting your bridge on there and making sure that you know the angle clears your bridge by about a sixteenth of an inch something like that so i'll give you some idea uh, that's just kind of a ballpark another another ballpark is you look down them like this and when you look flat here this you know i i wouldn't say this should disappear the top of this but you should be you know you should you know, you should be up on your binding anyway. Like, it should be kind of level here. You should be able to physically see that the neck has a little bit of angle to it. Now, if this is way below the top, then you're way too steep. If it's way above the top, you're way too high. So, you know, it should be, you should be able to look down this and see that this is dropping here compared to this. And it should be, I would say, about halfway up your binding. It would probably be a good guess. 
if this is level with your top, you're probably on the edge of being a little bit too steep. So those are just some ballparks. <clears throat> All right, well, we're going to close it there. Thank you so much for joining in this morning, and I'll see you next Friday morning at 8 o'clock sharp.